And the theme I'd like to explore today is business itself and the business of business. As the Archbishop of Canterbury so eloquently put it not so long ago, I want to ask where are the moral questions today in today's economic discourse? And as a fundamentalist, a fundamental atheist that is, I find it strange to be quoting the Archbishop but he got it absolutely right when he mused that perhaps what we are shrinking away from is getting a new perspective. The guiding principle by which most of us live our lives today in the industrialized world is a separation, if you like, of our working and our personal lives. Work is the thing you do to make a living, whilst our good life, our moral life, if you like, is lived elsewhere. It's lived with families, it's lived with friends, and quite often in doing charity or voluntary work. I think just giving users often echo this dichotomy. They talk about the things they do for charity as being profoundly meaningful, whilst the world of business can sometimes, not always, sometimes be so very meaningless. And now that our financial systems appear to be in ruin, politicians in disgrace, I believe we have the opportunity to reopen the debate. I believe we have not only the opportunity, but the duty to do so. Because whilst we're so ready to point the finger at politicians, at bankers, where is the acknowledgement of our own responsibility in all of this? I mean us, here, in this room, people who run businesses, people who run charities, people who employ people, people who make investment decisions, people who define the services and products that we consume every single day. As Amatya Sen argues, what is needed above all is an understanding of how a variety of organizations, from the market to the institutions of state, to which I would add private institutions, can together contribute to producing a more decent economic world. And by private institutions, I mean companies, large and small, that play such a significant role in our lives and collectively keep the economy alive. I believe the time has come for those of us involved in corporate leadership, and I include charity leaders in this as well, to adopt new forms of behavior. We must begin with the notion that business and ethics, rather than being incompatible, actually go hand in hand. And by the way, I'm not referring here to corporate social responsibility, which in my opinion is a charade, because in the vast majority of cases, it is so divorced from the real purpose of business. You know, here's our co corporate social responsibility, and here's the business, and the two hardly ever meet. No, I'm referring to the purpose of business itself. After all, the debate is not a new one. Of course, I'm not alone in believing this. In the most notorious conversion since the Damascene one, Jack Welch now calls shareholder value the dumbest idea in the world. A result, not a strategy. Your main constituencies, he says, are your employees, customers, and products. And here's the paradox. It is only when a company chooses not to make the maximization of profit its primary goal that we stand to create long-term value for shareholders. In other words, profit is a mere byproduct of something much greater. Creating a great product, developing employees, serving customers in brilliant ways, and of course, let's not forget the poor shareholders. A company needs to serve all these stakeholders in a balanced way. Why then is there so little of this in evidence? Why? Because the alternative calls for a radically new mindset. There needs to develop a general consensus that success is not measured only in profits, only in growth. It requires a painful change of behavior, which most people, not to mention politicians, are ill-prepared for. More specifically, it requires 
companies to change the way they behave, shareholders, customers and suppliers, and employees, all of them. So first, if we take the investors, you know, shareholders have got to stop acting like lemmings. They must cease their folly in their relentless quest for continuous growth at unsustainable levels. The quote that I love the most was that of Chuck Prince, lately, alas, of Citibank, who said, when the music played, you simply had to continue to dance. Well, rubbish, I say to that. Running companies for long-term sustainability requires shareholders to understand, really understand, that sometimes decisions that may have a negative impact on immediate profit may have long-term value. It requires customers and clients, and dare I say it, even charities, to stop seeking the lowest price rather than the best value without any regard to long-term impact. It requires them to look at their companies <clears throat> with whom they work as partners and seek solutions that are mutually beneficial. But thirdly and probably most importantly, actually no, definitely most importantly, the real change must start from companies themselves with the behavior of all employees. And make no mistake, that's you and that's me and how we choose to interact with each other and with the outside world. I do admire the many companies, most of them social enterprises, however you choose to define that term, I do not know, that generate huge social value through what they do. But I believe that innovation is possible on a much larger scale throughout the economy if we consider it not from the angle of what a company does, but how it does it. Thanks to a very unusual group of investors we are just giving, we've been allowed to experiment and innovate, not just with what we do, which we do every day, but how we do it. Everyone is a co-owner of the business and expected to act as such. There are no incentives based on bonus schemes. Instead, a proportion of our profits are shared by all. We have a flat structure with hardly any hierarchy. We strive to work in true partnerships with charities. All our profits are reinvested in the business. This is despite the fact that we are a for-profit company. But above all, above everything else, we've thrown away the rule book. We simply, <clears throat> excuse me, trust everyone to do the right thing. And why did we make these choices? Because we believe that it brings out the best in people and therefore works best for the company. I mean, look at the normal way of doing things. When things go wrong, as they often do, as they invariably do, we in business and society, what do we do? What do we reach for? The answer is rules, regulations, controls, more of them, better ones, more of them again. We've all succumbed to the temptation. As companies, we try and control employees and dictate what they do and say. Charities, we want to control what our supporters say, and so it goes on and on and on ad infinitum. It's a vain delusion. The idea that we can actually control these things is an utterly vain delusion, especially in this day of the internet, which continues to make the dissemination of information the fastest the world has ever known. I mean, just ask the London Metropolitan Police about that. But listen to what Ricardo Semler has to say of Semco, the Brazilian manufacturing company. I don't know if some of you are familiar with it. He says, I believe the obsession with control is a delusion and increasingly a fatal business error. The more we grab for it, the more it slips away. And ever more desperate measures replied, spawning the Enron, spawning, spawning the world comms, and I'm sure there are a host of other examples today. And as the control mechanism grows harsher and harsher, what is lost is the central purpose of business. Any business, namely a satisfying and worthwhile life for those involved and a reasonable, note the word reasonable, reward for their investment and their hard work. It is only in the absence of rules that business can get the best out of people and become truly excellent 
An innovative organisation does not need people who ask themselves whether they're following the rules, whether they're following the procedures. It needs people who are constantly looking for better ways of doing things and constantly challenging what's been done before. And how that's achieved is actually quite difficult, to be honest, difficult to articulate because, in truth, it is difficult. It's very subtle. And I'll try and summarize what we've been doing at Just Giving. We aim to have honest conversations with each other, difficult ones. We aim to constantly debate how to serve our customers better. And far from being soft and quirky, ours is a tough and rigorous environment where decisions are made on facts, not on egos, and innovation happens without fear of failure. But these things can only emerge when you trust each other. We do not even have, wait for this, an org chart. And I'm often asked, how can you possibly not have an organizational chart? And we say, what would we want one for? We work in teams. We work in project teams. The teams form. The teams dissolve, depending on the projects. projects. Some teams are more permanent than others. But an org chart is useless. What matters is the job at hand that needs to get done. And effective teams are made up of people who are self-motivated and keep each other accountable. And believe me, that is very, very difficult. Because this means that everyone in the team, the person you're going to have a drink with that evening, the person you go out with at weekends is holding you accountable, not so-called managers. Management and leadership comes with experience. It's there to provide direction. It's there to provide guidance and to hold people accountable when teams fail to do so. This sounds simple, but as I've said, it's very difficult in practice because challenge requires courage, and most of us are conditioned by culture and education to be compliant rather than questioning, especially at work. But when people feel themselves to be highly accountable for what they contribute, when they're to be called to account by their peers for any shortcomings, when people are motivated by a deep sense of involvement in what they're doing and purpose, not because they've been told what to do or given the authority to do it, that's when they perform to the best of their abilities out of respect for and commitment to their team to their customers, to their shareholders. Where they have a meaningful say in the business, regardless of the nature of the job they do, they do not need to be told what to do. And if you do not need to be told what to do, then the need for hierarchy disappears. The structures that were created for the industries of the Victorian age, for the assembly lines of Henry Ford, really are no longer appropriate for this age of the internet. In summary, social innovation is available to all of us, in all businesses, everything we're part of, and in the organizations to which we belong, but only if we truly want it. Thank you.